Ms. Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh, uh, thanks for your time and welcome to Al Arabiya English. Uh, can you begin with summing up your journey uh, from the 1970s, London of the 1970s to present day Britain? How has Britain changed over the years? Well, Aslam alaikum and thank you very much indeed for having me um, on the programme. There have been many changes um, in London. I haven't spent much of my life there. I can uh, comment on the change between what's happening south of the border and indeed my home country, which is Scotland. But as you, you say, my, my father migrated from India to Pakistan and moved to London where he met my mother. Uh, and they married in, in London and uh, I was born there. But spent just the first four years of my life and the rest of my life in Scotland. But things have very much changed um, over the past number of years. Um, Scotland, as you will be aware, had an independence referendum in 2014. And what that did was uh, involve many people in politics who felt disenfranchised, didn't feel part of the United Kingdom uh, as it stood then. Of course, it's a changed shape now in the post-EU uh, well, post referendum uh, era that we are in. Uh, but Scotland, uh, for me, um, has always been home. And I think, very interestingly for your viewers, most people like myself who are Asians, Muslims living in Scotland, define themselves as Scottish Asians or Scottish Muslims. So there's a deep sense of uh, attachment to Scotland. And I think uh, that is testament to the people of Scotland, the governments of Scotland, having treated uh, people like me and my father, who is an immigrant, uh, as if we belong. And uh, that's where we feel most happy in the whole of the UK is in Scotland. You are visiting the region to discuss issues related to women and extremism. Uh, do you see them as separate issues or, or related to each other? I was the very first uh, Asian Muslim woman from Scotland uh, to be elected to any parliament in either Scotland, uh, the UK Parliament, or indeed the European Union. So with that, of course, uh, came a responsibility that people expected of me to speak on all of these issues as a woman and indeed as a Muslim. Now, I believe that uh, we should increase as far as we possibly can the number of women who are involved in politics in Scotland, in the UK and indeed around the world, because I think that will change the face of politics, change the face of policy making, and from a global perspective, hopefully change the way we look at things. And that then leads me on to conflict issues. Uh, as you know, we are facing many issues um, across the world, issues of terrorism and extremism. The question is, uh, how do we tackle them and are they being tackled as best as they possibly can? I think a space needs to be created for women across the world and particularly women in the Muslim world. And I say women uh, in the Muslim world because we have a sense of validity when we talk about our religion. We would hope that people who share our religion will listen to what we have to say when we send a very clear message that Daesh does not represent Islam. Indeed, I feel that Islam is the antidote to Daesh. We need to make sure that uh, women across the world can have an opportunity to work together and try and find a solution uh, to combat whatever it is that's driving people uh, to these actions that are certainly not representative of Islam. If you look at Europe and the Middle East, there are synergies and there are also challenges. Uh, in terms of gender equality, what, how much do you think uh, the, two country, the, the two regions can, can complement each other? One of my plans um, since election is to um, introduce or to, to make sure we inaugurate a, an annual um, international global uh, Muslim women parliamentarian summit. Mm -hmm. And my idea is to bring Muslim women parliamentarians from all over the world and indeed women who represent uh, constituencies where there are Muslim people living to come together to talk about how we can share our good policies that are working in action, what we can do to alleviate poverty, what we can do to um, take away the drive of people uh, to Daesh and have a different narrative about Islam, a different narrative about what Muslim uh, women stand for because for far too long now People are telling me, as a Muslim woman and other Muslim women across the world, what they think we think, but they don't know us. And it's our time to stand together and stand tall and let people know that we're here to do very, very good in this world. The refugee crisis is something that has divided uh, Europe to a large extent. Uh, do you think there are areas in which Europe can contribute and what next should be expected from European countries? Scotland stands next to refugees. Uh, it's very sad and I think it's a scourge on, on the society as a whole that it took 
the washing up of that little boy, Aileen Curdy, on the beach to prompt people into action. Scotland's very, very proud that of all of the refugees that have come to the United Kingdom, Scotland has housed and homed two thirds of all of the refugees uh, that have come to the United Kingdom. And not just housed and homed them, but um, welcomed them into our communities, into our schools, into our daily lives. And that's part of a very long process, but it is not enough. The UK government is not doing enough. We do not have control over the policy in Scotland. Otherwise, we would be looking after many, many more refugees than we currently are. But how many people have to die? How much more do we need to see for the world to deal with this issue? We will be judged on how we have acted and behaved across this world in this crisis. As we speak, as you conduct this interview, as people wake up or go to sleep every day, there are people, children, dying, um, either of starvation or because of bomb blasts, and we need to do something about it. Now, in the House of Commons, my party, the SNP, have consistently called upon the UK government to do more, and we will continue to do so. Uh, you will be aware that we voted against airstrikes on Syria, and that is because at that time there were already 10 countries actively involved in bombing campaigns. That wasn't making the difference. There needs to be a concerted effort to find a solution. And that must be done by joined up thinking and working collectively. And most importantly, the long-term solution must include rebuilding a country that was once great, that's been destroyed by all of this. So yeah. we have work to do and Scotland stands next to refugees to take on whatever comes our way. As somebody who's looked very closely at the trade and investment scenario within Scotland and Greater Britain, how do you look at uh, a phenomenon such as Brexit and what impact is it likely to have uh, in the long run? In terms of the uh, economic impact, we have seen the pound plummet uh, to levels uh, that we haven't seen for 30 years now. Uh, and that's even before Article 50 has been invoked uh, and the true impact of Brexit is to be seen. That is a matter for the UK government to find and navigate a way through. And it's, I think it's fair to say that there is little, if not no, confidence in the UK government whatsoever because their lack of ability in terms of planning. Now, any government should be able to plan for, for either outcome in a referendum. Quite clearly, that hasn't been the case. So they're playing catch up. But the people of Scotland um, have made their voice heard in this matter. And Nicola Sturgeon, who has a mandate in terms of her manifesto uh, to uh, make sure that the will of the Scottish people um, is listened to, will do her utmost to ensure that every avenue is investigated to ensure a continued membership of the EU. Ms. Tasmina Ahmed-Sheikh, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.